I meet people that are guilty, condemned, and ashamed. Anti-gospel tools from hell. Guilt says I'm not forgiven. Condemnation says my life's worthy of judgment. Shame says it's still who I am. Anti-gospel. There's things that we think are hurting people that sometimes it's shame. I met a lady who was dying of AIDS. AIDS wasn't killing her. Shame was. I met her in a service. She came up for prayer. Her name was Rose in our city. It's a real person. Not a parable. She came up for prayer. One of those secret prayers. Like, just pray for me. God knows. And Holy Spirit went. <laughs> just sniffing. <laughs> I said, honey. What's wrong with your blood? What do you have in your blood? She went, uh, uh, diabetes. And then with all my heart and no discernment, no God telling me different, with all my heart, I prayed for her and came against the curse of diabetes. And I spoke to her pancreas and I'm praying, and she don't have diabetes. And with all my heart, I'm praying. And she sees me loving her and now she's feeling like, what a dog I am. I got this man of God praying for diabetes. I ain't even got diabetes. <laughs> he, he's so sincere and he's giving it all he got. And it ain't even there. And I thought, well, one good thing is it ain't never coming. That thing is so freaked out and intimidated. So I ain't even getting near that lady. I, I ain't even going to try because if that guy comes around, go by. So I said, well, because here's what happened. She walked away crying. And two days later, she comes to my pastoral office. My administrator said, there's a lady to see you. And I said, tell her to come on back. And I saw her through the window. I thought, that's that lady that was up. Healing service. She came into my office, precious black lady from our city. And she, she had gospel heritage and roots. And she said, oh, I lied. I lied. I lied to the man of God. She goes, I lied to the man of God. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. What do you mean? Oh. She said, you knew something was wrong with my blood. You knew it. You were mad at God. I said, well, I am. <laughs> I'm okay if you call me a man of God. It's what I am. It's not arrogant. I am a man of God. He lives in me. He paid an incredible price to get in me. I'm not bashful about it. I'm a house fit for a king. <laughs> People ought to know he lives here. It's not a secret hideout residence, not a 007 identity, secret Christian. God, come and hide out here. Nobody will know. <laughs> you need to break away, get away, God, from all the busy rush. Come on. <laughs> You're a house fit for a king. Yeah. Come on. He paid an amazing price. To get back inside of us. And we're going to mealy mouth that around. And be falsely humble. Say well yeah but you know. Well you know none of us are perfect. My Bible says through one sacrifice. He is perfected forever. Those. Who are being sanctified. <laughs> He says the worshipers have been perfected and purified and now we have no more consciousness of sins. <laughs> if that's not the gospel you understand, it's not the gospel he's preaching. It's the sin conscious lie of the devil that's crept into the church that's trying to make you work harder to be what you already are. You have to start being righteous to bear righteous fruit. You have to be accepted to live accepted. You have to be a son to live like one. You have to be first. So you're empowered to do. We get it backwards and that's a problem. So I said, Rose, why did you lie about diabetes? Because of what you really have. What's going on with you? 
She said, I'm dying of AIDS. And she bawled and bawled in my office. She bawled. People are hurting. The mistakes they made are destroying them without the clarity of this gospel. The gospel's hope for the hopeless. You think sometimes, well, I made my bed, I'm sleeping in it. No, he made you a brand new one with clean sheets. You ought to crawl in it. It's really comfortable. <laughs> so here's Rose standing there. I said, why'd you lie to me? What's going on? I'm dying of AIDS. I said, wow. I said, you couldn't tell me because of the way you contracted it. Is that true? And she bawled harder. I left her calm down, gave her time to cry, and I assured her I loved her. I said, you need to talk to me. I said, who knows you have AIDS? She said, no one. Uh, a six foot tall, 150 pound framed woman that's 100 pounds doesn't look well. She said, all my friends are asking. I'm just telling them I'm okay. And none are saying, you need to check. I'm telling them I'm fine. Because I and then she fall again, fall again. I watched shame just grip her like a vice. I said, honey, look at me. She told me, when I turned 50, I didn't feel like a woman. This lie came and said that the prime of my life has passed and I've lost my womanhood when I turned 50. What a psychological, ridiculous, demonic lie. When aren't you his girl? When aren't you a woman? But see, it was that definition, that exploitation of women, that thing of the world that makes you think you have to be something to be a woman. And what it did was it put her as a Christian in bed with several men to feel like a woman. And she'd violate her conscience and gray out herself and and she'd go back in another bed with another guy that enjoyed her vulnerability and didn't care about her, just wanted what he could get from her. Crawling in bed with a man doesn't make you a woman. It just satisfies his same deception. And in the process, HIV got in her. And now the reality of her sin that she's already guilty of in her soul and already grayed out by, slaps her in the face and bites her like a viper. And now she's dying because of her sin. And shame is the stronghold that's binding her to it. And I looked at her and I smiled, and this is not me normally. I smiled and I said, honey, I'm not praying for you. I said, you're going to go tell somebody what you did and why you have what you have. You have a best friend? Yeah, it's Karen. You know Karen? Karen's your best friend. She doesn't even know. I said, girl, when you tell her, she's going to want, you're going to test her. When you tell her, she's going to want to grab you and say, girlfriend, what are you? She's, she, she's going to feel mad because you didn't give her the chance to love you this whole time. I said, you go get Karen and you tell her what's in your blood and why. And you tell her you made a big mistake and it's not who you are. And she's bawling. Because I read in my Bible, I read something in there that was cool. It said, if you confess your faults to one another, you pray for one another, you're healed. <laughs> wonder if that's true. Long story short, Rose came into my office about four weeks later. 153 pounds. She waited to come in because she wanted her second test. Her second test was negative, so she went and got two more for two more months and it's gone. You know why? Because of the mercy of God. Because sometimes you make a bed that's too uncomfortable to sleep in. And you go, what did I do? And sometimes it's a painful lesson, but it's a lesson nonetheless. 
And I'll tell you what, when you change on the inside and wish you didn't do what you did, that's when you're no longer the one that did. In Acts 2, they killed the Son of God and were convicted by the Holy Spirit that they were guilty. And they were cut to their heart. Pretty emotional scene, I'm sure. It wasn't shoplifting candy. We killed our Messiah. <gasps> Come on. No denial, no soft pedal, and no sugar coat, and Holy Spirit, light, illumination, <gasps> killed our Messiah. We released Barabbas. We mocked him. We had him beat. We had him. Pilate wanted to release him, and we killed our Savior. Ah! The Bible says they were cut to the heart, and they cried out and said, Men, brothers, what do we do now? Peter said, repent, change the way you think, wish you didn't kill him, be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you all be sons. Whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, 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 Peter, wait, come on, tighten up a little, Peter, this is loose, wait, dude, we killed him. Yeah, I know, but right now you wish you didn't. If you could do it over, you wouldn't be guilty because you wouldn't have killed him. So you're not guilty. So be free, be baptized, get the old man off you and rise up and be new and be a son. Let's get on with who you are. Oh, is that in your Bible? What was the only thing they could do to make up for killing the Son of God? Repent. That doesn't mean cry and say you're sorry. It means change the way you think and feel about it. Doesn't mean come up here, ooh, 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 I killed the son. Ooh, 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 and then you leave like a murderer. It means, oh my God, I was so blind. I didn't know. My God, if I knew what I'd seen, I would have never done it. Rose, Rose, if I'd seen what I know now, I would have never been in bed with those men. Now guess what the truth is? The lady I'm talking to isn't the woman that slept with him. Yeah! You get this? God knows that. And we need to know that. Or she's just a fornicator. Well, honey, you mess around with fire, you're going to get burned. Well, you, you know, so you're going to have to reap, girl. God's mercy is... Way beyond that. <laughs> Way beyond that. You see, that doesn't give you a permission to live loose and fall on His mercy. That puts such an integrity in you that the last thing you want to do is miss God because He's incredible. See, Todd said it today. He said, I'm in love. I don't have any desire for anything but Him because He's incredible. The mercy of God is designed to put integrity back inside of us. And we're afraid to preach the truth because we think it'll give us permission to keep living loose and just fall on mercy. Are you kidding me? You couldn't do that and look yourself in the mirror. You couldn't do that with a clear conscience. That would devour you and you would know it on the inside. I am not running the risk of preaching a cheap gospel that gives men permission to stay the same. This is what changes us. You're guilty of the death of the Son of God and He says, change the way you think and come on into the family. Why is that too hard? What are you going to do to make up for the death of the Son of God? What are you going to do to make up for the mistakes you made? What are you going to do to fix the things you think you earn? How are you going to change the nasty act of yesterday? How are you going to go back and rewrite the books and change time? You're not, but you can change. And God says when you change, this is as if it never happened. Old things removed, all things new. <laughs> I will never stand before God and answer for the sins of my life. <laughs> and I so know that, that it has destroyed the desire and stronghold of sin in my life. 
I've found in the body of Christ there's people like Rose that feel like they earned what they have in their body. And some of us feel like, well, I knew better. And I shouldn't have did what I did because I did what I did. I got what I got or this happened or whatever. Or, hey, I, you know. And all of a sudden we're accepting something that mercy destroys. And I've found that there's a whole lot of good Christian people that are carrying the marks of yesterday's mistakes. There's young ladies. I didn't realize how rampant it was, but there's young ladies that have just cut themselves and cut themselves, and they carry those marks. And now they're in love with Jesus, and they look at the marks, and, and, and it reminds them of stuff, and they try to turn it into a testimony, and that's so good. But I'll tell you what, when God sweeps his hand over there and gives you just skin that doesn't show that, like brand new skin, that's powerful. I watched a lady that wouldn't even wear short sleeves anymore. Her arms were so marred. In the hottest weather, she wore long sleeves. Because she was so tired of answering for her marks. And this thing was marking her. We watch Jesus take every burn and every scar off of her body. Why? Because of mercy. Because she will never answer for the day she did that. She's born again. What the blood forgives, the body removes. The blood was shed to forgive the act of your sin, but the body was beaten brutally to take the effects and price of sin out of you. You eat his flesh and you drink his blood. It's the healing, redeeming gospel of Christ. It's why Rose doesn't have HIV. It's why we've lost count of people that have had hepatitis. That have been healed. It's why we've lost count of people with STDs. That have made mistakes. And here's the thing. that Here's why I make it a, a specific topic. Because I've learned in the Holy Spirit. That a lot of Christians feel like they earned that mark. Well if we're getting what we earned. We ought to all go to hell right now. You hurt your memory. Through binges. And you did something. Just one time, you just overdosed and took more than you ever took and you didn't come out of it clean and your mind's not like it used to be and you can't remember the same and you know it's because of that night. And somehow we don't contend for the restoration because we feel responsible for doing what we did and we brought it on ourselves. Mercy is so much greater than that, church. I'm telling you, there's people that have changed. And they're not the people that they remember. But yet what was in that remembrance is still trying to hang in them. And it marks you. Sometimes tries to condemn you. Sometimes makes you regret. Especially if it's a sickness that progresses and starts taking away life and longevity. And then you're saying, man, I wish I wouldn't have went there. Why would I have to do that? Well, at least God loves me. At least I'm going to heaven. No, we as the church need to go after that thing with violence and tell it to get out of the people of God. I've seen a lot of people redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I've seen a mother dying of hepatitis who finally got her kids back because she's born again and the social services gave her kids back because her life's clean. And now hepatitis is killing her at age like 40. That is not the will of God. She will never answer for being a prostitute. She will never answer for snorting coke. She will never answer for shooting heroin. She will only answer for her faith in Christ. Then how can hepatitis steal her life now that Christ gave her life? So get out of her body right now. Do you know they released her from the medical chart of having hepatitis because it's so confusing because there's no markers, there's no evidence, there's no hepatitis. And it's weird to have her on the medical history of it because there's no evidence or proof of it in her. Why? They told her it's like you never had hepatitis. Why? It's like she never sinned. That's one story. I'm not exaggerating. That's one story of hundreds. The blood of Jesus is speaking better things than the blood of Abel. The gospel 
is amazing. I always tell people, you don't have to tell me what you did, what you got. Nobody needs to judge you. It doesn't matter what's wrong. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. Some of us should have got bit and never did. Some of us got caught. What Jesus did is catch us off. So we're putting off the old and putting on the new.